I've always had a hard time understanding Warburg impedance. Warburg impedance is the impedance associated with mass transport, specifically diffusion. While I could conceptually understand the impedance associated with a resistor or a capacitor, I never had an intuitive understanding to the impedance associated with diffusion. Why is it that you get this 45 degree angle in the Nyquist plot? Why is it that the Warburg circuit element has a one over the square root of frequency dependence? Well, in this video, I'd like to share with you what I would consider to be a conceptual or an intuitive understanding to Warburg impedance. Now, before we begin, please don't forget to like and subscribe, and if you have any questions, leave them in the comments section below. Warburg impedance is characterized by this diagonal line in the Nyquist plot. This line has a 45 degree angle with respect to the origin and is associated with the semi-infinite linear planar diffusion of a redox reaction in an electrochemical system. The circuit element used to describe this is called the Warburg circuit element, and it's usually equal to a constant, maybe W or sometimes sigma, divided by the square root of the frequency. The Warburg circuit element is usually not used by itself. It is incorporated into something like a Randall circuit, which consists of the solution resistance, a series resistor, RU, which is in series with the electrical double layer capacitance, CDL, and the charge transfer resistance, both in parallel. The Warburg circuit element is then in series with the charge transfer resistance. So you'll have RCT in series with W, and both of these are parallel with the electrical double layer capacitance. To help us understand what's going on, we're going to do a chronoamperometry experiment. And if you are unfamiliar with chronoamperometry, I'd recommend you watch my video on it. In our chronoamperometry experiment, we step the potential and we observe this spike in the current followed by a gradual decay. This initial spike in the current is associated with Faraday electron transfer reactions, as well as the charging of the electrical double layer. The current decay is mathematically described by the Cottrell equation, where we observe a one over the square root of time dependence on the current. Physically, what is happening is we step the potential of the electrical double layer to the potential that we set it to. In this case, it charges the electrical double layer positively, so we have positive charge on the metal conductive electrode surface. And in this example, we'll use iron two plus. Any iron two plus that is near the electrode surface gets oxidized to iron three plus. Well, over time, the iron two plus that's getting oxidized gets converted to iron three plus, and we build up a layer of iron three plus near the electrode surface. For any more oxidation reactions to occur, an iron two plus molecule must effectively diffuse through this layer of iron three plus molecules. This layer is sometimes referred to as the depletion layer, as iron two plus is depleted near the electrode surface, and this layer starts to grow over time. This is why we observe a decrease in the current. For more current to flow, more iron two plus molecules have to make it to the electrode surface, but they have to diffuse from a thicker and thicker distance, a thicker depletion layer, a thicker diffusion layer, if you will. With this picture in mind, we can now start to think about and rationalize what is going on in Warburg impedance. In a way, we can think about our chronoamperogram as a proxy for our EIS data. Because time is inversely proportional to frequency, we can think about points along our chronoamperogram as different frequencies. For example, the initial spike in the current, which is associated with electrical double layer charging and some Faradaic reactions, is happening in the few microseconds, micro to milliseconds timescale. Well, that's the high to mid frequency region of our Nyquist plot. And in the high to mid frequency of the Nyquist plot, we observe a semicircle, which is associated with electrical double layer charging and charge transfer resistance. As we move along the chronoamperogram, we're going to lower and lower frequencies. We observe that the current also decreases. It's going lower and lower. So as the current decreases, we are going to lower and lower frequencies, 
we also observe that the impedance increases. So we have lower currents, we get higher impedance. And while not mathematically rigorous, it is very interesting to note that in the Cottrell equation, we observe a one over the square root of time dependence on the current. This becomes a square root of frequency dependence. Well, this square root of frequency dependence makes it into EIS because the impedance is a frequency dependent voltage divided by a frequency dependent current. Well, if you have a uh, square root of frequency dependent current based on the Cottrell equation and it's in the denominator, then we can start to rationalize why we get a one over the square root of frequency dependence in the Warburg circuit element. Now, again, this is not mathematically rigorous and to be truthful, uh, the math involved in coming up with the Warburg impedance involves solving a second order differential equation with special boundary conditions. But what is interesting is that it's the same uh, procedure for how the Cottrell equation was derived. And on a more important note, the one over the square root of time dependence on the current is observed in many different electrochemical techniques. And in EIS, this ends up being a one over the square root of frequency dependence. So we can start to think about Warburg impedance conceptually from this chronoamperometry experiment. But how do we describe or understand the 45 degree angle in the Nyquist plot? Why is it that the impedance increases on a 45 degree angle? Well, 45 degrees is a very special angle. It means that the real and the imaginary impedance is increasing at the same rate. Well, what is physically the real and the imaginary impedance? Well, the real impedance we can think of as the distance of the diffusion layer. So as the diffusion layer thickness increases, the charge, the iron two plus, has a longer distance to travel before it can pass along a charge. If you're thinking about just conductivity, it's harder to conduct something when, it's, when there's a longer distance for charge to move through. So as the diffusion layer thickness increases, we can think of that as the real impedance increasing. But what about the imaginary impedance? What does the imaginary impedance represent? Well, we only get imaginary impedance when we see a phase shift or a phase angle. And that happens when we get a time delay. So as we have a bigger and bigger diffusion layer thickness, not only is it a longer distance for us to pass charge through it, but there's also a time element. It takes longer for say an iron two plus molecule to diffuse through a larger and larger diffusion layer thickness to get to the electrode surface to undergo a redox reaction. So, it, so we can think of the real impedance as the physical distance of the diffusion layer to pass that charge along. And because that layer is getting pretty thick, it takes more time for the molecule uh, to get there, which is the imaginary impedance. Well, if the real impedance and the imaginary impedance are increasing at the same rate, that means that the molecule has to be moving at the same speed, which we can think of as the diffusion coefficient. The diffusion coefficient has units of centimeters squared per second. That's the speed of a moving plane. When I started to think about Warburg impedance from the perspective of a molecule carrying charge through a diffusion layer, it started to make a lot more sense and I could understand Warburg impedance. Additionally, I could start to rationalize and think about other forms of Warburg impedance like a Warburg open or a Warburg short in the case of a porous membrane. Thinking about a molecule as the as carrying charge through a physical distance and the time it takes for to carry that charge really started to help me rationalize these different types of Nyquist plots for all the different forms of Warburg impedance, especially when you compare it to the case of normal Warburg diffusion. Anyway, I hope that this was helpful and got you thinking a little bit more about Warburg impedance. And let me know if you have any questions, leave them in the comments section. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you soon.